Hi, I'm Susan Javinsky with Morningstar. The Federal Reserve has started to raise interest rates. Inflation is still running hot, and some market watchers are talking about a recession. Joining me today to share Morningstar's take on the markets is Dave Sakara. Dave is Chief U.S. Market Strategist in Morningstar's Equity Research Group. So Dave, let's pivot and talk a little bit about the inflation expectations that the group has. Earlier this year, we said that we expected inflation to start to subside in the second half of 2022. Are we still thinking that? You know, according to our U.S. head of economics, we do still expect inflation will start to subside you know, in the second half of this year. So a lot of the inflation that we have had have been due to a number of one-time factors. You know, think about some of the supply bottlenecks, some of the disruptions that we've had, you know, some of the shortages that have been caused by the pandemic. You know, those we do expect to start easing you know, in the second half of this year. Now, we did slightly bump up our inflation expectation for this year at the beginning of April. So we're looking at 4.5% this year. But really, more importantly to me, is that we're still looking for below 2% for the two years thereafter, which are actually both well below the consensus estimates by the street. So Dave, let's talk about the stock and bond market specifically. What are your expectations there for this year? Well, in the equity markets, you know, we do this bottom-up composite where we take the fair values as assigned by all of our equity analysts for the stocks to trade in the U.S. So right now, after the sell-off we've had this year, we're looking at the market trading at a 6% discount you know, to our fair value estimates. Now, when I start breaking that down into different categories, you know, if you remember at the beginning of the year, we had noted that we thought that value stocks were undervalued and there were good tailwinds. You know, value stocks have actually performed okay this year. I think our index is up a little bit over 3%. Really, it's the core and the growth stocks that have really taken the brunt of the sell-off. You know, both areas that we had noted, according to our analysts, you know, were overvalued. So I think the core stocks are down you know, over 7%, and the growth stocks are actually down over 17% year-to-date. Now, with core stocks down as much as they are, they're actually now getting to the point where they're looking relatively undervalued, mm -hmm. you know, on whole trading at about a 7% discount to our fair values. So while I still like value stocks and I still think there's good tailwinds, you know, on a valuation basis, I think now's a good time to be moving, you know, into, you know, the growth category as well. The other thing I would note that in the small cap space is probably where we see you know, some of the most attractive valuations today. Now, getting back to what we were talking about earlier with you know, our outlook for inflation and for you know, GDP growth, I think small cap stocks are pretty well positioned to outperform you know, going forward from here. Now, turning over here to uh, the fixed income markets, you know, again, coming into the year, we did expect the interest rates have, would, were going to rise. You know, we've certainly seen that. You know, I think the 10-year Treasury bond is up 1.4%, you know, 1.5% you know, since the end of last year. So a lot of, you know, kind of the main rise that we were expecting, you know, we've already probably seen, you know, year to date. Now, having said that, I do still expect that we'll see interest rates continue to rise, albeit at probably a slower rate over the rest of the year. You know, I think the 10-year Treasury should probably get over 3% before people start reevaluating, you know, where that kind of next level might be there. So in that kind of environment with interest rates, especially long rates, you know, still rising, I think probably that three to five year duration place is still where investors get kind of that best, you know, risk reward trade off for the amount of yield pickup that you get, you know, versus the amount of duration risk that you take. And specifically, I still also like the corporate bond market here. So again, while spreads you know, are on the tighter side when you look at you know, kind of a long-term historical basis, you know, when I think about kind of our robust economic outlook and think about inflation starting to moderate, that actually bodes pretty well for the corporate bond market. You know, that's going to help keep default rates relatively low. That's going to minimize you know, the number of downgrades that we would expect to see. Plus, it would also help in you know, getting more upgrades from the rating agencies you know, over the next 12 to 18 months. So now there are some, a handful of factors that could jeopardize the expectations that you have for stocks and bonds for this year. Um, the first is, of course, slowing economic growth. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we did actually ratchet our economic growth rate, you know, down a little bit for this year and for next. And a good amount of that was really just recalibrating because of this, you know, spike that we've seen thus far this year in interest rates. And of course, you know, as interest rates go up, you know, things like mortgages and other consumer borrowing, you know, get to be more expensive. So that will put a little bit of a damper on consumer spending. Now, having said that, you know, we still expect that consumer spending will do pretty well this year, albeit I do expect to see a shift as people start moving away from the good spending that we've seen you know, over the past two years during the pandemic, you know, back into a lot of those services areas. You know, plus, you know, we should see, you know, good production levels this year as those supply bottlenecks and some of those, you know, shortages, you know, ease up.
Another risk to the, to the forecast could be tightening monetary policy. Talk about that one. Sure. So, you know, I do think the Fed probably did get behind itself a little bit and they now have to play, you know, catch up here with, you know, inflation running as hot as it is. So there's really kind of two parts to monetary policy. You know, first is, you know, managing the federal funds rate. So the Fed tr most traditionally is managing its monetary policy, you know, in the short term part. So we are looking for, you know, increases in the federal funds rate this year. You know, no surprise, everybody's, you know, expecting that. Now, based on some of the language that we've heard from Chair Powell and some of the other Fed board members, you know, it appears that we might be looking at, you know, some 50 basis point increases over the next couple of meetings. The other part that we're watching for is more clarity as far as, you know, quantitative tightening. So as you remember, you know, during the pandemic, you know, the Fed went through a quantitative easing program, you know, making monthly purchases, you know, in the bond markets for both treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in order to be able to provide liquidity to the markets, you know, during all that time of disruption. So now we're going through the opposite where they're going to start letting, you know, their balance sheets start to roll off. Yeah, I think that they're probably going to let about $95 billion worth of bonds roll off per month, which, you know, to put that in context, you know, that's over a trillion dollars of liquidity that will be taken out of the markets on an annualized basis. So we're watching those. We're watching to see, you know, how that's going to work through the markets. So at this point, you know, we don't think that's something that's really going to impact, you know, our economic outlook from here, but it is certainly something that we're monitoring. So Dave, you touched on rising interest rates as a possible risk to the outlook, but let's talk a little bit more about what impact rising interest rates could have on that outlook. Sure. So there's really two areas when I'm thinking about rising interest rates and how they might impact you know, the markets. You know, so first, from just a pure economic point of view, as those interest rates are going, you know, increases, you know, the borrowing costs. So when I think about things like mortgages, you know, that could put a damper, you know, in the housing market. As other consumer borrowing costs go up, you could see less consumer spending. So, of course, that all could impact, you know, corporate earnings, you know, going forward. The other part that I would be concerned about is if interest rates spike, you know, too far, too fast from here, is that, you know, from a financial point of view, when people are valuing stocks, you know, they look for a specific, you know, required rate of return or internal rate of return, you know, when they're doing their discounted cash flow analysis. So with interest rates rising as much as they have, I actually don't think they've really impacted those required rates of return mm -hmm. yet, because I don't think most investors really brought their required rates down nearly as much as like the 10-year Treasury had fallen during the pandemic. Now that we're getting back up towards 3% and start going over 3%, I could start seeing you know, some investors that have brought those you know, required rates of return down, starting to lift those back up again. And of course, as they start increasing the required rates of return, you know, that decreases the price that they're willing to pay for that stock today. And then lastly, there's, of course, geopolitical risk mm -hmm. that, that's going on in the world right now. And talk a little bit about how that risk in particular might pose a threat to your outlook. Yeah, and geopolitical risk is really, you know, from my point of view, you know, probably one of the hardest risks, you know, really to analyze and especially hard for, you know, investors really to manage that risk in their portfolios. So really that gets back to making sure that you have, you know, the right risk allocation in your portfolios, you know, based on your own individual needs. And the problem with the geopolitical risk is that they're usually low probability, but can be, you know, high severity risks. So at this point, you know, we did have, you know, our webinar about a month ago talking about, you know, Ukraine specifically and why we didn't think that the Russian invasion would have an impact, you know, on the U.S. markets. Now, having said that, as, you know, the conflict is still ongoing, there is risk that that conflict could widen or that there's a possibility for, you know, other unforeseen events, you know, to occur surrounding that. So the thing I would probably watch for there for investors is, you know, make sure you're dialed into what that right allocation is for you. And, you know, as we're watching you know, that event specifically or other geopolitical events, you know, in general, you know, as they heat up, you know, that might be times that you do look to reduce, you know, some of your risk assets. And then when there is that market pullback, you know, make sure you have the, uh, the intestinal fortitude to be able to put that money, you know, back into the market, you know, after you do see those dips. Well, Dave, thank you so much for your time sharing your market outlook and for these risk factors that you're keeping an eye on today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in.